Mr. Tony Thornton. How are you? Life is good, Dom. How are you? I'm good. Well, life is good. You're right. I'm doing great. Doing great. I see your big smile and face there. Yeah. You just came back for some travel, didn't you? Uh, we did. Yep. Had um, had a, a little personal time, a little vacation time up in Kansas a couple of weeks ago. So, uh, yeah, I came back refreshed and ready to ready to go. Ready to rock and roll. Well, that's good. I'm glad you're refreshed for this show. Hey, Tony Thornton, who the heck are you? And how is it you <laughs> come to be speaking to all these forward facing contractors all over the world? Dom, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you guys today. Uh, first and foremost, you know, uh, I'm a fence guy. That's what I tell everybody. I, I grew up in the fencing, fencing world, okay? Yeah. Not, not the fencing with the swords, but the fencing <laughs> with the hammers, okay, uh, and the tools. But um, grew up in the fencing industry, had the opportunity to run several companies and, and mm. grow companies, and, and uh, for the last eight years have actually been serving as the executive director of the uh, American Fence Association. So that's how I become so well known in our industry because I was running the organization that was supporting and helping, you know, so many in our in our fencing uh, industry and in our fencing space. Uh, so uh, for you and I to meet, as you know, we met through a, a, a representative in the fencing industry. So yeah, uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's exciting. It, it, you know what's crazy though? It is exciting, but what's crazy is that fencing has an association and it's a thing. It really is a thing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's unique that every industry, every, especially every trade industry, needs that go-to organization, mm. that organization that's looking out for them, trying to help them, better educate them, provide certifications, training, whatever their needs are. Um, I, I do think that uh, there's a lot of relevancy in every trade organization of being there and supporting, you know, right. those craftsmen, yeah. those tradesmen, because uh, we're real, you know? Yeah. You know, I, it, this is, uh, you know, today we're going to be talking about profits and efficiency and, and the operational side because you have experience as a business owner, you've seen the association, but can I just jump over to the side for a second? Sure. What, what kind of contractors join an association? We're not talking about the fencing association, but I wonder if you see the same thing I do. What kind of contractors join their trade association? Plumbing, HVAC, windows, it doesn't matter, but what kind of contractors join their association? Especially for startups, I think a trade organization helps those young companies grow quicker mm. and not make some of the same mistakes that some of us old school guys may have made that weren't part of an organization. Right. Um, we have more peers in the industry now sharing their experiences, good, bad, and indifferent yeah. than we've ever had. Uh, back in my day of growing up, you know, I had that special secret. Nobody needs to know what I'm doing. But uh, I think that there's a, a share and we grow attitude in our trade organizations now. And I think that, that that is number one. A young company can grow quicker and scale quicker and get more positioned. I think uh, especially on the HAVAC, excuse me, in the electrical and the plumbing, it's the certifications and the, and the, um, and the licensing that is a very, very important to those. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the fencing industry doesn't have that licensing, uh, you know, in place yet, but it's, it's, it's coming. Um, working very closely uh, with a lot of architects, engineers, and those type people. Uh, yeah. we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah. So it, that's a great answer. Interesting answer. So we've got people who are new to the industry should join their associate. We're not talking about the fencing association. We're not talking about the cabinet makers association. We're just talking about associations in general. I, I agree with you. And what I find is that people who join exactly. associations take it seriously. It's just, it's that little bit of getting into things and they, they want to be part of it. They want to learn. They want to share if they can. I, I'm sure you're the same as me. I get more than I give, you know, the more I give it's the, it's better for me. I learn more, but that's what, that's the kind of people I find joining associations. I agree with you. Uh, I think this younger generation is more open-minded to, you know, what everybody else is doing. Uh, and and uh, again, this generation that we're in right now is more open to sharing. Uh, then again, I, I use the term quite often, the old school guys like me, you know, uh, but uh, those people that get it plugged into an organization, I've said for years and years, I don't care what type of trade or, or any type of organization, even a professional organization, you know, be it, um, you know, physician or dental or whatever, um, you get out of it what you put into it. That's and right. it goes back to what you, it goes back to what you just said, tenfold I get as one fold I give, but mm. my giving I get 
and everybody, you know, shares in the, in the benefit of that. So it's yeah. a, it's a win-win for everybody. I love it. You and I've never met. We're clearly from different parts of the continent, <laughs> just given that I have a funny accent compared to you. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, uh, I tell everybody, you know, th- this is a Mississippi draw. Okay. This is who Tony Thornton is. All right. Yeah. Uh, just an old country boy that grew up installing fence and, uh, you know, uh, moved through the ranks. Uh, to, I, I even tell people as I was executive director of the American Fence Association, who would have ever thought some country kid from Mississippi would be running an organization that's so important to our trade industry. Yeah. But, um, you know, that was the path that we traveled and uh, it was a good path. Every time I've heard somebody say, who am I? Just some country boy. Whenever somebody <laughs> starts a sentence like that, those are the people that crush the rest of us. You just oh, yeah. uh, So I'm looking forward to today. <laughs> It's awesome, man. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Hey, paint us a picture if you don't mind, because you said you owned a fencing or you had some ownership in a, um, a fencing company before and everybody's got a different idea of a fence. You know, you got people sure. think white picket fence, you got people think aluminum fencing, you got people thinking about ranch cross fencing with uh, barbed wire. What, what, what were your experiences and what was your application of fencing when you were a business owner? Certainly. Uh, well, early in my career, at the age of 15, I, I got into the industry because of a neighbor that lived down the street. He stopped one day. He picks me up. I've talked to your dad. Let's go build a fence. That started my career, uh, not, un- unknowing, but that's what happened. I worked for that uh, company every summer all the way through college and then became operations manager. We grew that company to about $7.5 uh, million in overall sales. Wow. And uh, we were running, you know, 12 to 15 crews, about 60 employees, including a full fab shop, weld shop, uh, including gate operator installation and access control services. So that company grew uh, very quickly, very well, had a great team. OK, it wasn't Tony. It was the team. Uh, and, and then at age 29, I decided, you know what? Uh, I got that entrepreneur spirit. It's Tony and, time. Uh, my um, my employer at the time, uh, phenomenal, uh, you know, individual, great mentor says, hey. You know, the only way you're ever going to know is go do it. So uh, he wished me good luck and I went on my way and I was very successful at owning my own company, uh, running my own company and actually expanded into the wholesale distribution industry uh, within the uh, fencing industry and trade as well. So I've got the contractor knowledge. I've got the wholesale distribution knowledge. And then later in life, um, got to be part of a manufacturing group. So you bring all three of those aspects and it was a Mm. perfect foundation to become the American Fence Association Executive Director because I could bring a little bit of that experience from all of those. And it's kind of funny in the fact that, you know, I could walk the walk, I could talk the talk with the contractors that was wanting to participate and join the organization, right? But um, we scaled every company that we were part of. Uh, Again, Tony didn't do it by himself. We always put the right team members in the right places. We give them a job responsibility and say, hey, uh, you know, give me a report and let's talk about it if we're, if we're not having the results we need. Uh, I'm a firm believer in letting your team do their job, no micromanaging. And at the end of the day, you're probably going to get better results from that. Yeah. Do you, that's, that's a great insight there. Hire great people, trust them to do their job and then check that they're doing it. What kind of, we're going to get into this in a second, because today sure. we're here to talk about efficiency and profitability. But yeah. If you had a handful of tools that the most successful contractors are all using, what would those tools be? And, and I don't mean, I don't mean sledgehammers and pickaxes. I'm talking about business tools. I think there's three. Uh, first of all, it's the culture as a business owner is responsible for. Man, that's interesting. Uh, to develop yeah. a culture that everybody wants to work for. The words on the street that, you know, Tony or Dom has a company that you guys ought to check out. Uh, you know, the employees are happy. The employees are making more money than the owners. You know, they're buying, you know, new trucks and new boats and, you know, hunting rifles and all the things that goes into the fun of, of life. Oh, my God. Uh, you just me, described my perfect the, life. New boat, new truck, new rifle. Hey, uh, oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> Been there and done it, right? Uh, <laughs> but the, the second piece of the culture is um, knowing your numbers. I, I think so many business owners... Uh, or I hate to use this term, running their company by the seat of their pants or more or less letting the company run them instead of they run the company. Mm. And they don't know their numbers. Now they're blessed with good sales. They've got enough uh, money in the checking account to pay the bills that month. And the next month it's like, oh my gosh, I don't even have enough to make payroll. 
So I think it's very important that the numbers are, in my opinion, the second thing that you really got to focus on, how to budget, how to forecast, how to scale, how to grow. Those are the very, very important pieces. The third is your team and allowing them to do the work that we just talked about just a minute ago. So mm-hmm. that, that would be my three tools in the toolbox for business owners and entrepreneurs, you know, that was really wanting to scale and grow and, and, and not be tied to the chair every day, you know, let your people do their job, hire good people, let them do it. Yeah. Hire good people, trust them to do their job and hold them accountable when, and you know, they have to learn how to do their job and not everything goes great. Sometimes you're going to hit rocks that you didn't expect to be on the site and you're not going to put the fence post in the way you thought it was going to go. Exactly. Hey, Dom, you made a very, very good point. Accountability. And in all of my training and things that I've done for for many, many years, uh, you know, I tell everybody, you've got to set the right expectation in order to hold that individual accountable, right? So now if I say, hey, here's a here's a work order here, go do this. And I don't set the expectation or I haven't given him the training, the tools or the knowledge to go do that. That's on me. That's not on him. Right. So how can I hold an individual accountable when I didn't give him the tools to perform? So yeah. I think that, you know, setting the right expectations is very important, you know, as a business owner and that downlining into all of your other management personnel. Um, and then, then that takes internal training, you know, on, on the job training and other things. Yeah. You know, and what stands behind training and culture is meetings. And so many people are against meetings because they waste time with meetings. And, you know, as, as people listen to my show, we talk about how to have effective meetings and how to make the most of your yeah. time. But, you know, one of my clients said this to me and I thought it was so well, he just said it so well. Now you have to picture who this guy is. You know who Rambo is, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Imagine Rambo had an older, angrier cousin. <laughs> that's, like that's that. one of my clients. And so just picture that guy right? Couldn't whisper to save his life. I love the guy to death. He's one of the greatest human beings, biggest heart in the world, but you got to, <laughs> okay. So angry Rambo, angry older cousin Rambo, but he said to me, Dom, and this is after we'd been working together for a while. He goes, Dom, I finally come to realize my people are my tools. It used to be that his tools were his tools. His skill saw was his tool. The, the nailer was his tool. Now he'd gotten to the point where he realized, oh, actually my people are my tools. I thought that was so brilliant. It's, it's a very good assessment. Um, with, without good people, you're not going to be able to run an operation. You're certainly not going to be able to scale it. You know, you're going to be the business owner. I, I tell everybody in my consulting, you're, you're chief cook, bottle washer, uh, floor sweeper, installer, service guy. You are everything. And do you really want to be that person? No, you don't. As a business owner, you wanted to hire people, put them to work to where you could go enjoy the fruits of your labor. Right. Yeah. So uh, I appreciate his his uh, thoughts on that, because uh, I think that that's one of the most valuable assets that are our, our people, our team. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and interestingly, you started off the, of the three things you mentioned. I took my notes, Tony. I'm, I'm taking notes when you talk. I know <laughs> you know what you're talking about. Culture knowing my numbers and team. It's interesting that culture is on your list. Interesting as well that it was number one, because it's easy to overlook it and think, ah, lucky charms, rainbow fruit loops, unicorns. But man, it's the glue that holds everything together. This is so true. This is so true. I've seen so many successful companies in spite of not having a good culture because they just throw money at it, you know, uh, be successful. But at the end of the day, they're not successful in the big picture because everybody's unhappy. Everybody's always squabbling or mad at each other. But in the back of their mind, I can't walk away. I don't want to walk away because he's paying me a lot of money. So, you know, the the term, you know, fix it with money. uh, In my opinion, it's, it's not what you want. You know, I want that employee that wants to make a good, honest wage. But at the end of the day, he's happy. He's got a fruitful life. You know, he's got a good family, you know, and we're there as a team in an effort to help each other uh, build a long lasting relationship. And of course, you and I both know in today's time, you know, not only hiring an employee or a staff member is hard, the retention is even harder. That's true. Well, but it goes back to something that we were talking about here. So you do it. We have to train our people. You can either train them and they leave, which is always a risk, or you can not train them and they stay. And, and that's a road to a very, very bad existence as an owner. Anyways, 
Yeah. Sorry, Tony, go ahead. Looks like you had a no, point there. I was just going to say, you know, you, you said train, and I've got this slogan when I'm talking to, uh, you know, individuals in the industry, train, retain, and grow. Because if you train them, you're mm-hmm. going to be able to retain them because you're mm-hmm. investing in them. And they're going to give back to you as much as you give them. And then you're going to be able to grow together as a company and personally. And, and you know, that culture piece that we talked about early in the show, uh, the fact of knowing, you know, that they've got two kids and a daughter playing softball and a son playing hockey, I think that that's so, so important because as, as I owned my companies, as I was managing companies, I took that, uh, very, that responsibility very heavy in the fact that I wanted to know about them. Now, so a lot of them don't want to share, but they finally Which open up, yeah, right? and that's yeah. okay. That's their, it, yeah. that's, that's their personal preference, but those individuals that would open up, those are the ones that were actually the long-termers, the ones that says, you know what, I'm in it for the long haul. Tony cares, or, you know, the, the owner cares. Yeah. Uh, I just think it's really important. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, the way that I look at that, you, by the way, we're still not on our topic yet. I, I haven't forgotten. I know. That's okay. We're having fun. <laughs> I hope, yeah, we are. I hope everybody this else. This knows, is good stuff. This is, this is the stuff. But the thing that we forget is that we're talking to humans here. And I like to remember the kitchen table. I think about the kitchen table a lot. And, and it's not my kitchen table. I think about their kitchen table. When they go home, and they're sitting at their table with their kids and, and assuming it's a man talking to their wife and how was work today? Ah, oh, my boss. Or they say, you know, it's pretty good. Today we were doing this and we got trained on that. Okay. Well, though that's a good kitchen table conversation. I want them to say those kind of things that are real about us. And so I think about that kitchen table because we all know, I'm, I don't think it's just my house. If mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. And so I want, I want, my, and I, again, we're speaking as a men are the only one working. There's lots of sure. women in the trades and I'm recognizing sure. that too. But listen, if they're, if somebody's not happy, the spouse recognizes that. And they're the ones going, Hey, I found this job. And in indeed, yeah. Hey, I, I heard from Betty that so-and-so is hiring. Why don't you go look if you don't like it there. And that little, that, that little whisper in their ear turns into a scream and, and you got to take care of that. So yeah. retention is so important. It's incredibly important because it's impossible to find good people now. It's look, it's hard to find people, then impossible to find good people. We should keep the ones we've got and, you know, stop that bleed. I agree with that. If you train them um, and you give them worth, self-worth, uh, you treat them respectfully. Um, you know, again, those, those, those are the ones that's going to hang and stick with you. You know, that's going to be that retention piece. And once you get one or two, you're going to get more because this young kid that just started looks at that and says, wow, he's happy. He's been here for 10 years. Good gracious, man. That's a lifetime to a young kid, right? So um, it, it, it's, a, it's a domino effect. Everybody works off of each other and helps each other through that process. Yeah. One day we'll have to do a how to train your people episode because it's not as hard as folks think. It's really not. There, yeah. There's super, there's easy shortcuts now to do it properly and well. You, you may tell you the easiest shortcut. I read an yeah. article this week. Okay. You, 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 you row right into that one, man. Oh, okay. Treat others like you wish you would be treated. It's simple. Yeah. You know, treat others like you would expect someone to treat you as an employee or as an employer. I mean, that's, that's, that's where the rubber meets the road in my opinion and everything else comes together. Now, yeah. That's Tony's philosophy. You know, I don't know who else has got it, but that's me. Well, I don't know. You and I are smiling, so it must be working. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah. Tony, I've got a question for you. We should probably get to right. our topic. So here's the question. Is there a link between efficiency and profitability on the job site or, you know, running the company? And what does that look like? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I've, I've, in all of my experiences, my wheelhouse was putting together workflow challenges or weaknesses, evaluating mm-hmm. those workflow challenges to come up with a better procedure in order to be more efficient. Now, that's a domino, okay? We started with a challenge or a weakness. We evaluated it. We put it on a workflow chart. We cut out the pieces that we didn't need. We tried to streamline that whole process, put some blinders on, and we got more efficient. So at the end of the day, if we're more efficient, then at the end of the year, we're going to have more profit because that time that we were spinning our wheels or we were challenged and and held back and not being able to get the production uh, Mm -hmm. that we needed, we're going to be able to do more because uh, 
we're, we're doing it more efficiently. And I yeah. honestly believe that efficiency equal profitability and no matter what trade or what business that you're running. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It, we have to run things properly. If you're, if you're doubling up on work, uh, if there's confusion, confusion in discussions, if guys are walking across the job site, talking to each other and asking questions, that's all lost time. Yeah. I, I had a, a client, it, so the, my client's foreman, and this is a big shop. They happen to be a, a custom millwork shop. They had a big, big shop. Uh-huh. And their foreman's key word to everybody was buck and a half. And what he meant was every time you take a step that isn't needed, it costs the company a buck and a half. And so the guys made him a t-shirt with the silhouette of a buck and a half. I love it. Isn't that great? And and there's something I learned years ago from Vern Harnish. He wrote um, Scaling Up and Mastering the Rockefeller Habits, which are two excellent. It's one of the strategic planning systems I use. But he says, you know, your your message is getting through when your guys start to make fun of you, when they kind of mock you like, oh, buck and a half, buck and a half. Well, that T-shirt tells me that guy, I I could say his first name, Dennis, doing the right things because everybody knows it's a buck and a half, a buck and a half. He bought into it. The whole team bought into it. You know, yeah. and I think that's important when you got a, a group of team members, you know, employees and others that's working with you, you know, that culture is getting them to buy in to where you want to be and how you want it to go. Because every one of us have has, um, uh, you know, every one of us has got to kind of, you know, put a little bit of row time in on that on that process. I can't do it alone. I've got to have others and I got to bring them along. So I like that buck and a half uh, concept there. But they bought into it and they were excited about it. Like you said, made fun of it, had fun with it. Had and, fun with it. Yeah. What's, what's wrong with going to work and having fun? Come on. That, that's, yeah. that's, the, that's the end of the day, man. That's awesome. I'd love it if somebody sent us a picture of them and their whole crew in bucket and a half T-shirts. <laughs> hey, we may have to start the bucket and a half shirt, man. <laughs> we might have to do that. I prefer muleys over whitetails, but that's just me. There you go. There you um, go. I, th- uh, I want to observe something in the description you just gave. When you talked about efficiency, you said we find those workflow challenges, then we look at the procedure and then we fix it. And that makes us more efficient. I know I'm paraphrasing a bit, but is that what, yeah. what's, what's interesting about what you did is you went to, you went above the technical level. Like we're all good at whatever trade we started it. If we're a Mason, right. we started laying brick or stone, right? If you're a roofer, you probably started as a roofer. And so, you know, the technical side, you're like, well, the efficiency has got to come in and those guys are making too many trips with the wheelbarrow. And, but you pulled it way high up, which I love. And you went to workflow challenges. And so when I work with people, I always help them create some, it's super boring, Tony, but I like your word almost better. It's a operations flow chart. Yeah. Yeah. I use it consistently. Oh my gosh. Tell, okay. Well, thank you. Tell me why you use it consistently. That was my interviewer voice. Well, it's on the, you know, I get a big whiteboard. They don't have yeah. a whiteboard, you know, we'll pin up some paper on the wall. Yeah. But I mean, when you, when you put, when you put that flow chart, when you put that workflow process from the time that lead comes in on the phone, what's the next step? It's in a box and it's got somebody's name in it and what's their responsibilities. And then we do the next oh, flow next the, all the way through. And we said, you know what, that workflow stayed on Tony's desk. Sometimes we got to get out of our own way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite often. Okay. You're the owner. You're the problem. Get out of the way. Um, if it's sitting on a desk too long, then we got to do something about that. And that's where we slice and we give other responsibilities to the before and after, you know, participants, if we have to, uh, now in any process, I don't know how many spots we're going to stop or how many, you know, uh, segments that we're going to have to get that workflow completed, but I did an eval several years ago on a company that took 60 days to get the final invoice done. 60 days? 60 to get it done? To get oh. the invoice. Oh, how often do we see that? Yeah, it's painful. Owners yeah. listening right now are, are, are hearing that and they feel it as well. It's a real it, thing. You know, I mean, invoice should have been printed before the job was finished. And, the, and, and, and you know, there's some of those efficiency pieces that, that we'll talk about momentarily, but you know, either the, the job superintendent or the supervisor, you know, hand delivered. Miss Jones, let's do a quick walkthrough. Are you happy with everything? Here's the invoice, you know. Uh, my owner's authorized me to bring the check back. Can I have my money? You know, <laughs> we don't do it that way, right? But, but the point of it is, you know, having those procedures. But it goes back to what I said earlier, those expectations. Now, if the sales person did their job properly 
and they set the expectation that when we finish, we need you here, Miss Jones, and we need an, a, a walkthrough done. We need your approval. Yes, no, we're indifferent. And then, oh, Miss Jones, we're going to expect you to give us a check for that when we complete. Is that going to be okay? Oh, well, put your name and your initial right here by that. You see, yeah. setting those expectations through the contract process. Yeah. That's efficiency. That uh, is so well said. I mean, maybe you and I are just agreeing with each other because we get the, well, we have the benefit of seeing so many businesses from the owner level, you know, in the, whether we're talking them in the construction trailer on the job site yeah. or whatever, but yeah. th those, to everybody listening, if you've ever said to yourself, I wish I could get everything out of my head and on paper, that's what Tony and I are talking about. Putting it on paper puts you in control. Once it's on paper, you can look at it and say, huh, well, that's kind of ridiculous. 60 days for a customer to get an invoice. And the next question is super easy. Uh, how do we shorten that? How do we fix it? How that's do we right. fix it? And then right. once I have it on paper, I can fix it. Actually, one of the, the, the ways that I explain it to people is as soon as you put your business or a process on paper, you've basically turned it into a board game. Like you'd play with your kids, snakes and ladders, monopoly, doesn't matter, checkers. Thank you. Right. And so, but once you've got that board there, you can see the moves you need to make. Hey, yes. this should move over here. And Cindy's doing this now, but it should be George. George yep. and Cindy are doing it. That's causing confusion. And you just make the call. Uh, George, Cindy's going to do this from now on. George is like, okay. Yep. And, 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 you know, Dom, a lot of people say, I don't have time, but I tell those that throw that at me, you don't have time not to make the time. <laughs> Does well, that make yeah, sense? Yeah. You know, uh, at the end of the day, if you don't take the time to do those evaluations, then you're going to continue getting the same results that you're getting right now. So are you ready for a change? Yeah. And I'm huge on accountability. You know, if I go in and do an eval or a consult or, you know, talk to somebody, mentoring, mm -hmm. coaching or whatever, you know, I'm going to give them some play, you know, some pieces to play with, you know, a, a gameplay. And I'm going to hold them accountable in 30 days. Have you done this yet? Uh, no, we talked about this and you wanted to get to that point. And, you know, I'm asking you, so it goes back to the accountability factor uh, that we talked earlier. We set the expectation, but unless you're holding them accountable or calling them and say, Hey, did you do that, Dom? Oh, no, I didn't have time. Yeah. No, 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 no. Let's back up two steps. When are we going to do it? So, um, I think that that plays a huge piece into the efficiency, you know, package. Yeah. Um, you know, so. Yeah. So for anybody stuck on efficiency. Tony took us through a really important exercise where he went up into the organization. So if you're looking at an organizational chart, for instance, right, yeah. you got people doing the work, uh, putting up the fences, or it doesn't matter what your trade is, yeah. people assembling cabinets, doesn't matter. Then you've got right. some managers above that. Then you've got the owner who's listening. It's hundred percent owners who listen to the show. So it's all the owners, but the it. owner is in that shareholder mode as well as owner mode. What would the shareholder of this company say? They'd say the process is broken. It's taken us 60 days to get an invoice out. Yeah. You got to fix that. I've got my money in here and I want to make sure my money's protected. How do you fix that 60 day problem? I want to see you cut it in half in 30 days. You know, exactly. I want to see you cut it in half in a certain amount of time. Well, go cut it in half. It's, once you focus on something, anything can be accomplished. And, and I'm going to share one more piece of that. You know, uh, the workflow chart that you first do, I recommend leaving the names of the responsible parties off of it. And the reason being is I just want to see the process. I want to see that the phone rang. Okay. So a lead was taken on yeah. this date. Where does it go next? And then this is what happens next. And then this is what happens next and next and next and next. Then we come back and assign the individuals to those tasks, to those procedures, to that process. Then what you're going to see is, oh, Tony was here and he jumped over Dom to get to that. And then you know, there was where the confusion started. So why don't we reassign these responsibilities to Sue and Joe, right? So again, I start out with the process of step one through ever how many it takes to get to the end result. And then I go back and assign those individuals. And that's just my way of doing it. Uh, it's worked yeah. pretty, pretty smoothly for me, but I love the workflow uh, chart mentality because I do think that it offers so much to business owners and it takes time. You just got to take a half a day and, you know, sit down and make it happen. It, you people know, are going to laugh. It's people strategic are laugh. conversation and strategic planning. I mean, that's yeah. what it is. You know, uh, if uh, the people who listen to the show are going to laugh because I say this all the time. Here's what you need to do. You need to tell people you're at an appointment and you're at an appointment with Dominic or Tony. Put it in your calendar. Leave the office. Go to a coffee shop. 
put in your headphones, face the wall with a blank piece of paper and your favorite coffee and start writing. Um, do, can I share a little trick that I do for? Yeah, please. It's, it's hard to make a workflow. And the reason it's hard is when we start at the top, there's a whole bunch of if and what about, and there it, it starts to get messy. And so the trick is build it from the bottom. Ah. So take your blank page and at the very bottom of the page, write down the perfect ending to, uh, let's say a fence job, just yep. as an example. I don't know fencing like you do, but I'll, I'm going to get 80% of this right. Got it. The perfect ending is we collect a check from Mrs. Jones. The only question you have to ask yourself again and again and again through this little piece of paper is what has to happen immediately before that? So we collect a check from Mrs. Jones. What has to happen immediately before that, Tony? Boom. I write it down and I'm working my way from the bottom up and you could build that flow chart in about 10 minutes. Done. I like it. I might use that next week when I'm in Atlanta. How about that? I'm going to call it the Dom effect. No, call it the Tony Thornton method. <laughs> I think I learned that from an engineering firm somewhere that I was coaching, but you know, you got to simplify true. things, right? You know, I'm going to use the same concept that uh, when I take off blueprints for years and years, I had to take off blueprints for big commercial work. And once I did it, I'm right-handed. So I'd always start from the right. I'd go all the way around. Yep. Well, I'd, get up after I finished it, you know, put it on paper, I would come back and I would actually do it backwards. I would go from the left to make sure that I didn't miss anything. So what you're telling me is, okay, Tony, once you go from the top down, why don't you turn around and go from the bottom up and see if those steps, those procedures are still in place. So I'm going to take that same concept that I, that I did on blueprint reading and I'm going to, I'm going to implement it into, uh, into the flow chart, uh, you know, uh, process. I love it. Yeah. That's a good idea. A real Let good me idea. Let me smash this nail one more time for our listeners. You just mentioned blueprints. The function of blueprints is that you and I are in different states right now. We're thousands of miles apart. But if I drafted up a set of blueprints, I could send it to you and all the information you need to build that project is there, mm -hmm. right? That's the function of blueprints. The workflow that you talked about or what I call a flow chart is the blueprints for running the company. That's where, you know, we'll, we call them SOPs here. People who yep. aren't familiar with the word SOP is an acronym for standard operating procedure. The long word is how we do things here. Exactly. But that's our business owner blueprint. It's how we do our takeoffs. Yeah, absolutely. You know, talking about SOPs, and we're going to get back to that efficiencies in a minute, but SOPs really came to light for me. Um, my dad helped me start my company at age 29 and we're working together, you know, and everything's right here in Tony's head and I'm doing it all. You know, I'm scheduling, I'm coordinating, I'm making things happen. You know, I'm setting up meetings and all of that. And my dad stepped in my office and he said, well, son, he said, you know, what do we, what do we got planned for this, this, and this? And I said, dad, I, I, I got it in my head, but I'm, uh, I'm still working on it. And he looked me dead in the eyes and he says, well, what if you died tomorrow? <laughs> Your dad. I mean, this is my dad. You know, I'm 32 years of age. And he said, well, what if you died tomorrow? Nobody would know anything about what we're supposed to be doing. He's so right, that Tony. immediately made me think you got to put it on paper, Tony. You got to take what's out of your head. You got to put it on paper. You got to put procedures in place. And if Tony did have a, an illness, a sickness, or out of the office for two weeks or four weeks for vacation in Colorado, I love it. we got a process in place that everybody's going to keep this thing running. So I do believe that uh, uh, operating procedures are very, very important. I think it adds that efficiency piece back to the business of operating the company. And uh, that's what I call in the segment of the operations, you know, right in that, that wheelhouse spot for sure. When you, um, let's go back to that. I think you said you were 31 years old. Your dad walked in the office, had that, that aha moment with you. How good were you? How, how perfect was your system for putting it on paper? And what I mean is, did you get better over time or did you kind of suck at it in the beginning? Kind of sucked at it when I'm beginning. You know, you, you, you try to take the time. You're always saying, I don't have time to do this. And then you're rushing through it and you're not really taking the time to really, you know, we've heard the term, you know, the, what is it? The devil's in the details. Yeah, yeah. Okay. When we start out doing SOPs, we leave out the details or too many of the, you know, in the weeds details. And I tell everybody, if, if I know you come from the millwork side. Okay, so if, if you had to sit down and write step by step, detail by detail, in the weeds, everything that you had to do to build that perfect set of cabinets, right? Okay, and I did the same thing on fencing. 
we've got a long list of things that we had to do, right? It's too long. Uh, you know, so then you have to kind of figure out, okay, how do I, I, I minimize that, but yet still keep the impact and the uh, procedure in place or the wording in place for people to understand, oh, this is what Tony meant. Oh, right. this is what Dom meant, you know? Yeah. So there's that happy medium. But no, I think we all was, was sucky at it when we started and we got better at it over years. Yeah. Um, you know, because we understood more about what our, our goals were. I couldn't agree more. I mean, the first time I try a system, the first time I go do something, I'm not going to do a very good job or I'm going to be dead slow at it. You know, the yeah. first time you get contracted to build an eight sided pergola, you're on the calculator and you're, wow, I don't know how we're doing this. And every cut you're stressing out because it's expensive wood. And, but the ninth time you do it. Oh, that's yeah. easy. And, yeah. and it's the same thing. It, so I'm speaking to the owners listening to the show. Tony and I are talking about this as if it's easy. And it's it makes things easier, but it's starting it that's going to be tough. You're going to get rejection and objections from your team. Why do we have a new system? Why do I got to log my time on a job site? You know, I'm here. You dropped me off this morning. Yes. And I need you to log in. And we need to follow the plans. Yes, you're right. I do know you're here. And we need to track that. And... Because they they don't come at it from the same perspective as we do. And I'm, I'm not trying to create an us versus them, but their job is on the tools. My job is on the business. Yep. And I have to do my job. You got to do yours. And the homeowner's got to do theirs, which is pay me at the end of this job or progress, exactly. whatever it is. You got to pay this me. Everybody's true. got a job. Yep. This is true. Yeah. This is true. Hey, where were you hoping this conversation was going to go? Because you and I are all over like a beagle chasing hey, a bunny. You know what? But I I tell everybody, I call them these gravel roads. When you go down these gravel roads and it's good gravel roads, you know, and somebody's getting something out of it, I love it. But, you know, uh, the, the efficiency is equal profitability is kind of where we were, were focused on. And uh, as I told you in a quick interview a couple of weeks ago, I think there's three main components to the efficiencies piece, okay, mm -hmm. for any business owner, especially from a trades perspective. Uh, there's three areas. You've got to be efficient at your sales. You've got to be efficient at your operations. And you've got to be efficient at your installation. Now, I'm going to do a bottom up here. Okay. I'm going to do the Dom effect. Okay. Yeah. Everybody, in my opinion, throws money at the installation. Oh, if I could just get somebody with more experience. Oh, if I could just get this job installed quicker. Oh, if I can just put more labor on that job, you know, I can get to the next job. And they're throwing $100 bills at it. But yet the reality of the fact is that they're burning thousand dollar bills in the operations piece. I think that out of those three efficiency areas of a company, you've really got to put some really hard blinders on and spend a lot of time in that operations. What I mean by that is who is your quarterback? Who's moving the ball? Who's mm -hmm. passing the ball? What is happening today to where things can happen tomorrow or what's happening this week to where I can be prepared and positioned and staged for two weeks down the road. That individual is your most important player on your mm -hmm. team. And it may be you uh, as a business owner. That's okay. Um, but, you know, you've got to find those efficient methods and sales. There's three or four key components there. There are six or eight, ten components on the operations. And then, of course, the installation. We just got to train and we just got to focus. We got to set those expectations. And all of that comes, comes with the territory. Yeah. I want, I, can I share a story based on that? So first, I'm going to repeat your points. The, the three places we can be efficient is in sales, operations, and installations. So let's leave construction trades for just a minute. This is now business people having a business conversation. And I'm going to take you back in time when I started as, I've been coaching now for 22 years. So I've had all sorts of different clients. But in the past, I used to work with a lot of what you'd call white collar uh, companies. Yeah. And so this one time I was working with an accounting firm. Uh, just for the, the joke of it, I no longer work with accounting firms, but let's just throw that out there. Um, so I'm, I'm meeting with the owner of the firm and, I'm, and we're talking about efficiencies, where, where he thought the business could be better. And so one of the questions I said is, where do you think you're weak right now? I'm paraphrasing. But, and he goes, you know what? Our internal bookkeeping is not very good at all. And I thought to myself, you got to be kidding me. You're an accounting firm. Even if you do the most basic accounting, you're an absolute rock star, but all because he was the technician, which relates to your stage of installation yeah. in his mind, the weaknesses he saw were around his trade, which happened to be counting numbers. 
but he was missing the culture, the values, the team, the hiring, the training, all of those other things. And so for those of us listening right now, there's a couple of uh, fencing contractors. I'm thinking of uh, John, Alan, some of the guys, they're like, oh, this is all for me. But for those of you who aren't in fencing, we're still talking about the business of business, right? And you got to get your head out of the techno technician mode. I have to, you have, we all have to. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's the practical piece, no matter what, whether it be, you know, like you said, the business aspect or the trades aspect or the professional aspect, that practical piece is what we practice. That's what we do. And that's what we're usually good at. And I would be willing to say that most of your listeners started out being a good installer, a good yeah. tradesperson, a good professional. And they said, you know what? I can do this. Yeah. Let me jump out here and start my own company. And then in a couple of years, you know, they got yourself in a little bit of a bind because they didn't know how to run the business. And that's why I say it's so important to run your business and not let your business run you. But these efficiency pieces, uh, I think, will add that profit profitability on, on the, uh, you know, at the end of the day. Um, because we've got so much more of an advantage now than we did, you know, 10 years ago, especially 20 years ago with the technology. Um, I, 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 again, I, I'm a Mississippi kid. I'm a country boy. Uh, Here it comes. I'm, Here I'm, it I'm, comes. Challenged. I'm challenged. Okay. Technically I can make software work. And I tell everybody if Tony Thornton can make this software work, you can too. Yeah. Okay. So that's where my baseline is. Uh, but this business technology that's available for every professional out there these days, you've got to wrap your arms around that. You've got to embrace that. And you've got to find a system that works for you that's going to make your life more effective, efficient, and profitable. At the end of the day, this technology will advance your operation tenfold. Um, and, and through all of my consults and my evaluations that, I, that I've been doing over the last few years, uh, that's the one piece that most of these people are missing. And that go, even in sales, there's technology tools that will help you in your estimating, your tablets yeah. to do instant, you know, uh, I tell you, if you, get ready to go, if you get ready to go sell something, that customer knows more than you because there's this thing called Google. <laughs> and Google's already told them everything they need to know about this fence, this millwork, this cabinet, this backyard, whatever the case may be. They, they know more about it than you. So just listen. Right. But at the end of the day, they're going to say, hey. I need that quote. So if you've got your tablet, you've got your technology, you've got your estimating packages built in, and you can say, Mr. Jones, I just emailed you that quote. Oh, by the way, here it is on my tablet. Is there anything that we need to talk about that you're not ready to? Can we close this nail now? now? You yeah. Know? Can I get you on the schedule? Ask for it. Right. Can I can get you on the schedule? schedule? Things are getting busy. Yeah. So there's three or four components in that sales aspect that I think we can be more efficient in. One of them is that technology, you know, understanding, uh, you know, a new salesperson not knowing the products as well as some of our more seasoned people, get them trained, okay? And then the third is understanding what consultative selling is and when to shut up and just ask for the, ask for the you know, hey, can we eat you on schedule? I think those are three important pieces on the sales aspect. I love it. Um, which is going to make you more efficient, right? Yeah. So to everybody listening, uh, you and I, Tony, have covered an amazing amount of ground and we might have made it sound easy. <laughs> the reality is when this episode is over, everybody's got to go do something different in their business to get the value. And so for everybody listening, I'm just going to urge you and, and encourage you just do one thing. You know, Tony and I are looking back over a lifetime of experience and making it short stories and easy quotes, but I, I recognize, and I think you do too, too, Tony, it's tough. If you've got a guy in your crew, that's just angry and cursing all the time and won't listen, that makes it hard to put changes in place. So you've got to think real hard about the changes you got to put in place before you can put the changes you want to put in place. And just take one step forward every single day, every day, and you'll get there. Stay motivated. Yeah. Hey, uh, this has just been absolutely fantastic. If somebody wants to find you in this big wide world, are you findable? How do we find you? Yeah. Um, as you know, I uh, retired from the American Fence Association as executive director five weeks ago. Uh, I now uh, have Thornton Fence Consulting Group. And we totally focus on helping companies maximize their profitability, better understand, you know, take an entity all the way through how to make the money yeah. and build in these efficiencies and building in procedures and those type of things. But uh, I'm available at uh, info, fenceconsultinggroup.com. Uh, please visit my website, www.fenceconsultinggroup.com. And 
Uh, I've done videos for years, and everybody knows my cell number. It's 972-533-3658. I'd love to talk to you. <laughs> I thought I was the only lunatic who put my cell phone number on the internet. And this is why I keep getting calls from India about a lost package that I need a credit card to release. Uh, you need a warranty. You need a car warranty, man. I see that coming. <laughs> oh, just the phone calls I get, but it's my fault. I put my phone number on the internet. What did I expect was going to happen? I'm okay with that. You know what? If somebody needs some help, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those individuals like you, Dom. I want to give back. I want to yeah. help because at the end of the day, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Well, it's true. And you and I talked about that a little bit before the show. I'm one of the luckiest people in the world. I think you probably recognize yourself as well. I get to do what I love and help people. Yep. How bad exactly. is that? Right? <laughs> Not bad at all. It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's called servant leadership in other circles, right? But I that's what we're doing here is, yep. is paying it forward. Truth. Well, Tony, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And I, I'm just so blown away at your knowledge and, and uh, how easy it was to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate the opportunity. Everyone have a great day, safe week. And, uh, Keep on fencing if you're a fence guy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Talk to you later. Thanks. Have a great one. All right. Bye.